gosh, after all that, I, I feel as though I should just sit down again and say, yes, I've done all that. Now, um, <laughs> thank you very much. Lola is so flattering and nice when she introduces and all those different things, Yam, Lab, University's contact group. Now, I teach at Glendon. That's the most important thing. And that if you do go there next Saturday, you will be listening to students that I've been teaching all this week. And I've had such fun with them, I can't tell you. I would, I would love to have done two weeks, but I don't want Andrew to be out of budget, so that's not possible. <laughs> um, Lola, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, Lola is a great person. I congratulate her for bringing everybody together and inspiring everybody. She does a great job, and I really, really admire her. Thank you. She's walking around in a pair of shoes that I would be dead in if I didn't. <laughs> oh, I'm so full of admiration. I can't do it. They look great. <laughs> they look really great. Thanks, Lola. Um, we're going backwards now. We just had Andrew telling you how to introduce simultaneous. I'm just listening carefully. I agree with everything he said, of course. And, and by the way, the person who mentioned really, who mentioned maybe just running, listening to the news on the TV and trying to interpret it, it's an absolute killer. Never try it. It's so discouraging. And you know what? People speak Germanese on the television. You cannot do that in simultaneous. You can, but you won't do it well. Nobody does. Not even the greatest interpreter. So one wants to be encouraged, and I think all the other tips are better, right? And my students do this too. That's why I mention it. They say, oh, I was trying to do the BBC this morning. Don't try to the BBC. And certainly don't run with we can walk. Now, shall I get on with my, my job today is to say something about consecutive note-taking. You've all just had a go of consecutive note-taking. And um, my friend Lisette, who was sitting next to me, was watching me doing my note-taking and very flattering me saying, wow, look at that, because my notebook looks... Can you see anything at this distance? No, no. no I didn't think so. There's not much on it, maybe, oh, and lots of squiggles and pictures and things. And that's what I'm going to try and put up there, but I rather doubt you will be able to see much. Never mind. Uh, why do we need notes? Oh, I'd better say a few words, although you've heard more than enough about me, actually. Uh, what do I do to uh, right, just who I am, briefly, you heard that. Southampton University, where I read languages, German. French. Then I went to Germany, and I'm sure those of you who heard me speak before will recall that I started my professional life as a disc jockey. And um, if I may just briefly recap on that, it was very useful to, uh, as a training for interpreting. Very useful indeed. Um, I was in Germany in the 1960s. I go back a hell of a long way. And in Germany, um, I was working in a in kind of student club doing the discotheque and also on a radio show where I had to listen to the pop songs of the 60s, in English, of course, hear them, because there was nothing written in those days. You didn't have texts, you know, no, you just had to listen to, you try deciphering Mick Jagger, just try it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of deciphering of Mick Jagger going on there. And um, so I would listen to the English songs, pop songs, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, being one of them, I remember, and translate that into German. You feel an awful fool doing things like that, but anyway. And then I gave the voiceover afterwards. So it was a translation exercise. It was also a presentation exercise. I heard myself on the radio. I knew what I sounded like. And I got quite used to working with a microphone. How to work with a mic does phase people sometimes. So I was used to all those things. So it was actually a great job. I wish I could have gone on doing it, but when you're into your 60s, being a disc jockey is not really a... It's not an option anymore, is it? So I then went to Horrible Frankfurt uh, and became a translator in a company. I was working with German and English, so I had my credentials of translation. And then somebody told me that in Europe, as it's commonly known, i.e. the then European community, was looking for people British, English-speaking rather, English-speaking graduates to train them up as conference interpreters. Why? Because they couldn't find trained conference interpreters anywhere with English mother tongue properly trained to the right level with the right languages. They did not exist. Two or three existed. 
So most of the interpreting schools, those that existed in the UK, which is the main fishing ground, um, tra were, were training people with Spanish, sometimes with French too, but Spanish was not an EU language, right? Um, Russian, not an EU language. So they ran an in-house training scheme, and I was lucky enough to get on it, get through it, and then become a conference interpreter. So that's just briefly my background. Now I'm looking at consecutive. Why do we need to do consecutive interpreting at all? Why does anybody, does anyone tell me, is there any good reason? Why do we need to do, why do we need to take notes? Yeah, well it's obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, to help you uh, get the uh, logic uh, uh, flow of the speaker. Very good, very good, good point, absolutely. The logical flow, um, trigger recall as well, because we all have memories, um, and it means that we can, do a, we can cover a longer chunk. Now I know that a lot of people here will probably say they're used to working with speeches which are maybe, or utterances perhaps is a better word, of, of perhaps a minute or a couple of minutes. But in conference, and I think also in, in other areas now too, you are expected to be able to take notes and render a speech which is up to six minutes. If you want to join the European Union, the consecutive exam is a must. You don't go any further until you've done proof that you can do consecutive uh, interpreting. And those speeches are all six minutes. Um, the students at Glendon were working with ten minute speeches in consecutive, ten minutes, and doing a very good job. Thanks to Andrew. <laughs> and me. Well, thanks, <laughs> so that's why we, that is why we uh, realize we have to have consecutive. It's essential for all these walks. Uh, in the United Nations, they're not interested in consecutive. They don't use it. But even they admit that it is the basis of what interpreting is about. If you can do a good consecutive, you can learn how to do simultaneous very easily. How does our memory work? Because I keep getting this now from people, students as well. Oh, but I've got a rotten memory. Now, how do we teach students to interpret at the very beginning, whatever field they're going into later? You teach them to make short speeches and remember the essentials. Short, two to three minutes, no longer. Everyone says they can't do it. Oh, I can't remember, I can't remember. Uh, but they will remember if you give them the right kind of speeches where one thing leads to another just like Andrew's speech did. There was a beginning, it led to something else, there was his personal reference, and then there was a conclusion, right? And that's the way we teach interpreters, A, how to make speeches for each other, and then also how to strengthen the connections. Synapses, that's a good word for you. And how do we store the information? We, we listen to something, you're all listening to, to all sorts of interesting things all day. <coughs> That information is then stored, goes to the hippocampus, and it, that acts like a filing system, and from which you will retrieve the information that you need later. Um, I was just saying to my friend at the back there that you can retrieve information a lot more quickly when you're young, and I wish I were young and able to retrieve fast, but I still know how to do it, but it just takes a little bit longer. But the filing system's there. Your stuff is in your head. How good is your memory? You take a look, look at the list of numbers. If you just look at them, can anybody remember, I'm lousy with numbers too, almost certainly not, or you might have one of those visual minds that says, yes, I can remember. 0512 would be as far as I could get. If you have a look at it, you think to yourself, looking at elsewhere, how many can you remember? It's quite a good exercise, actually. Um, it's surprising how few. If you have interconnected things, objects, people, story, disease, cure, and so forth, then you remember it because it's part of a whole. And so we always try to get students when they're taking notes to, to visualize the picture of what's happening. To visualize Andrew going to the, going to the doctor. Andrew, we can see him bending over and having his spine touching all the good heavens, poor Andrew. But it's a very visual thing. And then he asks the question, did you all have that? And we all went, no, we never heard of it. <laughs> I'm muttering here, we don't do that in England, things like that. Uh, certainly not when I was a kid. But, uh, and then we remember that. We see Andrew, we imagine him. And then he talks about this, what was it called? Scoliosis. Uh, and then we think, oh yes, that was the, that was the thing. And... Um, Yes, there must be treatments come next. 
So, and I'm not looking at my notes at all. Treatments come next. There were three sorts of treatments. Was it physio, brace, and, and surgery? Yes. And, and then he said, as well as I remember, he said um, um, that it would get catch it early, or you know, having having the, the, the exams done in schools is a good idea because then you can catch them. So, but there's a picture. That is what this is all about. And that's why writing down tons of words on a page is never going to be the best option for um, doing a good consecutive. I mean, if I could, I'll pass my notebook round to you, like, just to look at this mess on, on the page. But it, was, it, it gave it all back to me with a few words. So we have short-term memory. That's what we train our students to do at the beginning. Short-term, two minutes. Two minutes is quite long, actually, but they remember pretty well everything. But then you don't put in too many details. You don't put names and numbers in at the beginning. And we know when we're working, unfortunately, there are going to be lots of names, of diseases, of this, of that, of numbers, of reports to the police, which have to be very detailed and very accurate. What we know is that we can remember about one minute. Uh, if you take seven un unconnected items, this, we haven't got time to go into this sort of thing now, but it's quite a good exercise. Just take any words, seven words, you know, like table, scoliosis, um, interpreting, uh, building, anything, and then think about those seven. You can just jot down seven if you want. And think how you can put them into a, a speech altogether. You will remember them that way. But if you just throw them into the air, you will forget them. So once they're tied together, auditive memory as well. Up to 20 items when they're connected. And I've done this a few times, but it, you know, we don't have an hour to play around with that. Where does your, your memory best work and your con concentration, and I put relaxation, that's your breakfast and your sleep the night before stuff, absolutely. Don't go, you know, all nervy. Adrenaline is good. Um, being nervous, Holly, you said that yesterday too, that actually people are, students are nervous, we are nervous before we interpret. That's good. Not when you're shaking like a leaf and feeling ill, but a bit of adrenaline there, you know, that's good. So one shouldn't be afraid of that. When does it not work so well? Oh, I'm being dealt. <laughs> We're going to get into discotheque mood in a minute. Uh, when it doesn't work badly is when you're really distracted by something, by anything, and you probably know this very well from your experience, or if you're really scared, I mean, scared to the point of shaking. You're not going to give your best, but allow yourself to be a bit nervous and a bit tense, no problem with that at all. That's my friend Francis at the top, who's a public speaker and former interpreter. Just with that information. This always does that. I don't know how to get rid of that clump, but anyway, that'll wake you up if you're sleeping at the back. Anyway. <laughs> How you can store information long term, you see the, res the results are very, very clear. Combination of seeing the visual and hearing, here's the story, here's my picture, and you get quite a lot. If you just hear, it's not so easy, and the same thing with just visual. So that's the ideal. So I'm going to do some notes in a minute. Yes, she was a good advertisement for us, Nicole, actually. Um, it's just a point that I didn't know, but the left side of your brain apparently controls the right side of the body, and that is the language side. I'm just thinking about it from what Andrew said about which side you put your headset on when you're, you, which side you, do, do, you, do you listen to it? In fact, it's always the right side with me, I'm just thinking, which is probably wrong. Because he's right, if you, if you have a headset on like this, you don't hear yourself speaking, you say rubbish. If you do this, you can at least hear the rubbish. <laughs> so, you're aware of it, and the students do. They say, oh my God, I said that. Yes, you did say that, yes. <laughs> so it's worth putting the, the headset on the right way around. Now, interpreters, oh, people say to me, interpreters must have great memories. No, they don't, absolutely not. Here's one that does not have a good memory for a start. Yes, for a short term. Uh, the memory needs the help, and that's where the notes are going to come in. I don't know how many times, I don't know how many of you have had this happen to you, but when I was working in the European institutions for years and years and years, gosh, you know, 20 years non-stop, I would go and interpret in Booth mostly in a meeting, but quite a lot of consent as well, and then be there all day, all, you know, really hard stuff, finance, whatever. Come out of it, you meet your colleague in the corridor who says, oh, hi, what, what meeting were you in today? Can't remember. Often, and you haven't possibly have forgotten people say. 
But yes, thank God, probably this is a natural sifting, which means we don't all go completely bananas, because if we tried to retain everything, uh, it wouldn't be good. The notes. How to do the notes, and why to do the notes. What's the point of notes? Here we go into the five key questions. This, these are the staples of what we need when we're taking notes. The first question is, why bother at all? It's worth asking yourself, why bother? Because it supports your memory, we've said that. It also helps you follow the structure. Uh, uh, one of our, uh, the gentlemen sitting at that table mentioned following the structure, very important. Because the students, when their memories are getting better and they can master two to three minutes, mix the order up quite often. Now you get through it, you think, oh, I forgot the bit about, I don't know, the operations. And you can fit it in after, but the consent notes help you to keep to the right order. Um, it also helps you to um, verbalize the whole thing. As you're writing your notes, you're listening, and you've got a, a picture at the end of those notes of what's happened, unlike being in the booth where uh, you're stuck, where you're there and you're in the hot seat. It also helps you, with your good, if you have good notes, to take the main ideas and mark them clearly, and the sub-ideas, the things which are slightly less important. The things that you put in, I would always put in brackets underneath the main idea. Um, where do you, those, that's why, that's the important thing, where, and I'll go into more of this in a minute too, where, this is what most people I know use, um, because, I think you said that too, Andrew, it's easy to turn pages on this size. The large one is okay, but if you happen to be standing, as I've often been, doing consecutive in a howling gale, for example, or in a cable car, or in all sorts of places where I've done it consecutive, it's difficult if you've got anything large, and you, you know, you've got two delegates or half a dozen or ministers or whatever. This is the easiest way. It's also fairly firm, so you can, you don't need a table. You can just take your notes like this. Not easy, but you can do it. So, by you know, experience, this is probably the best way. So you try to get the students, at least, and we're all set in our ways, of course, but if they start out like this, then they're, they'll be happy with that as well. Um, the notes, where? Yes, they have to be on a page. Well, you looked at, you, if you looked at my page, you'd say, what on earth is that mess? But for me, this is quick, easily readable, and I've covered a lot of space on my page. I haven't crammed all the stuff in together. When do you note when there's something to note? If it's a story and you think, I, I'm, I know I'm happy with this, you just jot down. I know. Whatever. The name of the disease or something like that. You don't necessarily need to write every damn word. In fact, you never write every word. That's what you don't do. You, you just write down the basics, the stuff which will push you, but not all the time. What happens if you don't understand? A question popped up, didn't it? What happens if you don't understand? You're taking your notes and you haven't understood somebody. I immediately would, and I do it automatically. I put the notebook down and look up, look at the speaker, try to glean from the body language. Don't start scribbling if you don't know what you're writing or say to students, because they tend to want to write even more. That's not a help. And of course, if you don't really can't get it, you put a squiggle in your notes, and at the end of your speech, you go back and say, would you be so kind as to give me that number again, or could you repeat the name of the illness, or whatever it would be. Fine. What do we note? The essentials. The essentials, the pillars, the links between the ideas. Links and links and links. If you don't have the links, which are the sort of glue that take your thoughts from one to another, you're lost. But, however, on the other hand, and, all those things have to be clearly marked. They're almost more important than anything else. But we'll look at that in a minute. And how we do it, ah, that's everybody for himself, of course. Um, economically, how about this? Analytically and creatively. And what does the page look like? Well, we, normally speaking, interpreters tend, and that's what we do when we're, you know, we have a particular pattern that I'm going to try at least to reproduce there so that you can see it at the back, and if you can't, doesn't matter. This is just to remember that what we have to do at every stage, whatever we're doing, whatever we're interpreting, whether it's short speeches with no notes, whether it's long ones or whether it's simultaneous, you first have to learn to listen, concentrate, analyze, reformulate, communicate. Okay, you know all these buzzwords, 
But it's worth remembering that at every stage they have to be present. And there's a nice picture of Barry. We are going to move on then when we teach people how to take notes in order to enable longer speeches, but to fill in the names and the details and the numbers. Yes, of course, that's what the technique is all about. Uh, the content, main ideas. There is a very good German word, mitdenken. Anybody here have German? Well, it means thinking with. It just means that you are going to think along with the speaker. And there's no other, naturally, there's no translation of it. But that's what we try to do, to, to follow. I became Andrew when I was taking the notes and you know, giving back the speech. Um, that's what you have to do. And I noticed that with my students this week, I've seen a wonderful switch from the distance from the speech of the speaker to becoming the speaker, which is a great thing to see. Uh, the passion of the speaker. I mean, I don't want them to be prima donnas and screaming in the booth and so forth, but if a speaker is fairly passionate about something, in whatever context, the interpreter has to give that back as well. Not just that we're doing it, you know, we become the speaker. And I saw that several times. I mean, I had one student who became Christine Lagarde, can you imagine? For a man, I think it's quite something. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, you, on the how, going back to... Oh, sure. You said economically, what else? Economically, <laughs> analytically. <laughs> and, yeah. oh, well, I analyze what, what this person is saying, not just the words, right? And Creative. creatively. And you might like to do lots of pretty pictures on your page. I know interpreters who work entirely on symbols, and I can't do that, but some do. So how are we going to do it? Symbols. Anybody like symbols? There are lots of useful symbols for interpreting, and most of us use the same, right? Rosan, n'est-ce pas? The, we go back to the old basics of what symbols you can use and how to abbreviate. Only masses of people don't realize how easy it is to use them once you get the hang. You don't have to do... I don't use symbols much. I, I haven't got that kind of mind. But some, yes. Um, visual props. The page should be really everything spread out on your page, not too much. You go down the page, top left to bottom right. That's the general way the eye works, and that is more or less how you're best able to recreate a speech, putting here main idea, verbs, tenses, very important as well. When did something happen? Is it going to happen in the future? And so on. And I, at, the, at the beginning, they all, they all try and cram everything. They try to save paper in the rainforest, and I say, forget that. Spread everything out, write as large as you can, write on one side only, not all of this stuff. No, you, you can always go through the, the notebook this way and then turn it around the other way to save the rainforest if you must. <laughs> but it's not essential. Can you recognize anybody on that? The links I mentioned, I just found some nice pictures with, you know, well done. Is he still there? Yes. I was actually, seriously now, I couldn't, I didn't have the time. I was desperately looking for a photograph of a certain person, personality here in Toronto, who's oh. been a lot of But I couldn't find one with him with an interpreter. And whereas oh. I've got Cameron and Hollande and that very discreet lady with the dark hair in the middle is their interpreter, who has, of course, done all her homework and so on. But what I'm using there is the things that are vital to, to note, the but and the and and the other hand, and who is saying the thing, whether it's the speaker, whether it's people, whether it's the journalist, whatever. That is also what people tend to miss out and then come a problem with the notes later. That's the notebook. We've said that already. Oh, yes, legibly I've added there too, which is not my case at all, I assure you, but it's legible to me. As long as you can read your own page and you've got your own notes, that's fine. I write, I was telling the students, stop writing things like, it is very difficult. You can't write things like that, it's ridiculous. So I write on a page things like, crap. I don't laugh, and it's perfectly true, I do. What I look, do is look at that and say to myself, it means that this is an unfortunate, bad, miserable, anyway, something negative. But you sit there, or I write, wow, or I write, uh, yuck. Yuck is really good. It's, it just sums up for you that this is something not pleasant, but you will remember what the speaker said anyway. This is just prodding you. 
Oh yes, he, he didn't like whatever it was. Yuck. Very useful. They, they find that odd and they say, you can't write that. Yeah, but nobody's looking at this except me, so it's fine. Diagonally across the page and down the page, that's always, we're always pushing them into that as well. Uh, it's really hard to find ways of finding symbols and stuff, uh, you know, using your, your laptop. I tried. Because when I'm drawing pictures and I'm squiggling all the time. But I did manage to get that. Anybody, can, can you see what that might possibly be? If you look at my L and G high, this is my limit. Yep. Very happy to be here. Yes, I, well done, yes. Yeah, because it's shorter than any other language, right? Yeah. What about I, W, O, uh, inverted commas? No. That's my symbol for um, would like to or want. W, and then I actually, I write a little O, but I can't do it on the bloody computer, so it's, it's, a, it's a large O, but it should be a, a large-ish W, and then a small little circle for the modal verbs. May, can, would, should, could, all these things you should have, you know, short version of, because they crop up all the time. The inverted commas, anybody? Talk. Talk. Talk, speak, um, wax, lyrical, anything which is verbal, you don't have to write the word down, that's enough. And it's really easy and quick. Re-exit. Thank you. Concerning the economic situation. Why would I need to write any more than that? And my re is great, no? About or concerning or anything of that, of that sort. And EC, the little EC for me is always and only in my notes economic. Doesn't change. Obviously capital EC is something different. Sit is all I need. Situation. Or I would put a little N, perhaps, but as I say, you can't do that. I couldn't do that with this system. And what's VVV v, 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 miserable face? <laughs> it's really dreadful, absolutely ghastly. It's ghastly. My students love when I say ghastly. What was the she said that? Ghastly. Um, the, the, the situation is indeed absolutely dreadful, terrible, frightful, and awful, generally speaking. We can't find enough bad things to say about the economic situation. We don't have to write down the words. We just get that. My VVV is just a way of saying this is extremely, and underlining it. I, do, I underline, which means a lot. So, very happy to be here. I might want to say I'm very happy, and I just underline the, the little smiley face. I also know students who, when they do the smiley face, I had one who, who, who made a great sort of fuss about making a smiley face, nice eyes and eyelashes on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but excuse me, by that time the speaker is, you know, <laughs> you're, you're doing the eye makeup. It's not, you're doing eye makeup. It's not absolutely ideal. I saw this, it's absolutely true, honestly. This is absolutely true. Um, exclamation, I love exclamation marks. You know, I'm really happy exclamation mark, and I and my wow, and gosh. It's just to show that there's some expression there, mm -hmm. and it helps them a little bit, instead of saying, they always do at the beginning, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to talk about, and so, they, they, and after a while, when they've got to grips with the notes, then you can start adding expression, and it's so important. It's so boring to listen to anyone without expression. Oh. Lines between ideas, that's pretty easy as well. So you know you jump from one notion, idea, point to the next. Just a line. And then at the, always the top left, on the left of your page, it's the but on the other hand, or the and, and the therefore, and the so, and the maybe, and all those things. What about mark, hope, exclamation mark, arrow, cos, both, e, rept, yeah, happy face. That's quite good on a computer. You can't, I can't, you can't imagine the hours, hours and hours I spent trying to do that. <laughs> thinking there won't be a flip chart in this, and so I thought I'd better get this ready in any case. But it gives you the idea. Anybody, any ideas? Because the microwave went on. What about my hope? <laughs> hope, yeah, that's fair. I don't have a symbol for hope. I could do with one, actually. Ma is just but. But I'm putting it in in a language that is the shortest of one of my languages, Italian. So, I mean, I can also do but. But it was just to illustrate, you use whatever language comes your way that you know that is short. But hope is very general. I didn't say I was hopeful. I, I just said there is hope. Looking forward, the arrow for me. 
using arrows, you know. Hope is on the horizon, something like that. There is hope around the corner, you know, it's not, all is not lost. Anything of that sort. We, we are fairly free, especially in conference interpreting, to render ideas. We, we, we tend, you know, we, we can be more perhaps freer with our choice of words than in some other situations. I'm aware of that. Cause, what about, well, that's because, what is it? Because of the Bank of England's report, which came out yesterday, which makes things look, which shows us that things are a little more optimistic. Something like that. But, but, but you get the idea. I could probably make that quite late and say, but actually there is, there, you know, things are not all bleak after all. And indeed, there is a degree of hope even on the horizon. Uh, because uh, um, the bank of it, the, the report that was issued by the Bank of England shows that, there, that things are looking up a little bit. The report, of course, was issued yesterday, and I might have, if I wanted to add, I read it, or you read it, which case I note that as well, in a bracket underneath, because it's a subthought. You read, maybe, you read, question mark. Um, it shows it's yeah, things that are really better. That's the model. And it goes, it goes starting here, across the page like that. So it would be, ladies and gentlemen, hi, Again, we're not going to say that. I, happy, easy, line. I want, now I do talk. Right, I'm going to talk about a little talk. The exit, wasn't it? Yeah, exit. I mean, that's just, you know, it's really, really miserable. I didn't do BBB because I don't even need it. Little face with just underlined several times. But comes over here, another line, but, or ma, or whatever. Hope in the middle of the page, exclamation mark. Because, in the corridor, here's the because. Bank of England, port, yesterday, some thought, it's a tiny little thing. Things are looking better. I mean, right. That's. Approximately, also, you can't see it at back, I know, but you've seen me scribbling it up, and you can have a look after this if you like. That's the, 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 that's the way in which I would tell anybody to How much time have I got? Sorry, I'm going on. Seven minutes. Seven minutes? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, the key is not to forget your own language or your own you code. <laughs> you have to develop your own dictionary. Yeah? You develop your own dictionary, develop your own language, exactly. You can develop your own system. You yeah. can develop your own system. You can find, I've got a list. I can actually, if you want, I can scan it and send it to you, Lola, of yeah. my own abbreviations. There are so many things like president, meeting, problem, question, stuff that comes up, agreement, disagreement, um, a, a problem. Problem, I just do a blob. I can't reproduce that on the computer, but just a sort of messy blob on the page. And you look at it and think, that's a mess. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. A mess. <laughs> so, oh, oh gosh, you know, there is, a, there is an issue here, a problem. Uh, any other words you like. Why? Because, big because, so and so and so, so, so. And who, I, big I, think this, and you think that, and the other thing, so forth. So that is how you can do it. And you need a collection. And you go to your, your meeting on what was it, scoliosis. You're going to have a list of vocabulary, perhaps, and certain words you know will crop up. Well, then abbreviate them just SC is going to be, isn't it, the, the abbreviation for that in that context. Um, if we're then talking about my friend Spectre on the Carsten in a speech, that will also be SC in another speech. It'll just be adapting whatever it is to the context. So you don't have to write down, you write down Svetlana Karsten once, maybe, and often that she says C, in the same with the scoliosis, or any other uh, disease, which are quite long, quite often, and so are the remedies, as I heard. So you write them once, or you put them on a separate page, and you will abbreviate throughout that speech the best you can. You don't write the name more than once, ever. Um, I have people, see people writing things like, oh, I don't know, balance of payments. No. That is BOP, but in, in a context, in a context. Uh, since I can't really demonstrate anymore, I hope that the, my message is clear to you. And I thought we might now uh, get from get on to some. Um, oh, where are we? One more. Look at that. I forgot I got this one. Sorry. Uh, a margin. Yes. Now, some people like to put all those becauses and eyes in the margin on the left. Must, should, would, want, can, know. 
I think everything is okay. What do you think, Andrew? Um, Lola agrees. That's that's the abbreviation for that. No. Pretty easy, yeah. I I I say that it's okay. Whatever it is, we don't know. I say that's fine. It's all right. I'm in favour of it. What do you, Andrew? What do you think? Well, anyway, we know that we know. Lola, Lola agrees with it. It's not much to write, and it should be down. But I, you know, it's difficult with on the computer. Um, the arrows are great too. If you've got the word at the top of the page, and the same word crops up three times, you just put an arrow from that word back down again to where you are in your notes. You don't have to write it twice. You arrow it down or arrow it up. And then I say let's demo, but well, we can't. But that's that's for. I think that really is it on notes now. And I can't really. I think tell you more. But I'm going to finish off with a completely different subject just to round off and wake you all up at the back. This is the stereotype of the translator and the interpreter according to a Professor Henderson of the University, I think the late Professor Henderson of the University of Bradford, who did some very serious research that I'm making look a little trivial, but it's not. Serious research on what came out as the stereotype translator. Put yourself in whichever shoes you like here. Introvert? Perfectionist? Self-sufficient? Huh? Routine? My translator friend said, so, mm, actually, yes, but not all. Uh, limited ambition, they hate it when you say that. <laughs> Interested in languages, one assumes that the interpreters are too low, not necessary. Um, given to self-doubt, eccentric, oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, I can't tell you how many eccentric translators I know. Really odd, and they call us eccentric. And the, and the stereotype interpreter, where we're self-reliant, articulate, superficial. Jack of all trades, arrogant, anxious, and since I cannot avoid putting Johnny Depp into something here, yeah, I put in Johnny Depp in the Pirates of the Caribbean in a meeting, if you ever see, it's a very important film to see. The, the, the um, what's it called, the, the Brethren Court or something, and they're all going around the table, and I, I thought it's just like the Council of Ministers meeting, so I'm sure other ministers will attend, without, without Johnny Depp and without the guns being fired off. Oh, we really like that. Here are, here's where I did my first consecutive, in a cable car, seriously. Up the mountain in the cable car. And I can't do heights. And I was in Germany, I was in Augsburg, the German hosts had the Irish then, Irish commissioner, Paddy Hillary, became the president. And I was the interpreter, so they, they were going to show um, Commissioner Hillary uh, the, the, this lovely view and so forth, and I'm standing here with my colleagues. There. And where's the interpreter? No, I said, I don't do heights. You do heights. <laughs> Commissioners to understand what otherwise. Ah, so I did. <laughs> and then my first dinner speech, I remember it very well, also in Dublin, everything happens with, to do with Irish. Uh, and it was an Italian chap from the commission, a small committee, and it was just before Christmas, and we had a, it was a Christmas dinner, and he made a speech in quite broken French. Yeah, English wasn't around very much in those, it's the early 70, 74, 75. Uh, and he said that in, I can remember what he said, and it was 1974. You, you never forget these things. He talked about how all the great literary works in English were actually written by Irish, because this was to please the host. <laughs> Uh, and he gave a few quotes, and I'm thinking, oh no, no. Anyway, so I got up and, and very nervously, terribly nervously, did it into English. And he said to me, Merci, mademoiselle, vous êtes beaucoup mieux pour moi. <laughs> <laughs> because he's Italian, speaking kind of poor English, and I was at least in my mother tongue, so. It's very sweet of him, I've never forgotten. And this is where I'd like to have interpreted. I'd like to have been between those two, being the inter famous Pavel, what is his name on the left, being Gorbachev's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. He really has seen some interesting things. And it's just a few interpreted that, but that wasn't the right side, as far as I remember. That's the guy with the cross. Oh, yeah. Pavel, yes, yes, no, exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. Exactly. And still, he's still with Gorbachev. I know. Here are more scenes with interpreters, just so that you see that, you know, I've actually also tried to think of healthcare and also other situations, not just the usual ones that I'm in or have been in. I like the, 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 the Putin well, and the Clinton one the best, actually. Yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, then from Palestine, uh, maybe Jerusalem. Uh, yeah. I don't see it properly. 
you, you, I'm sure we can find out easily who they are, but it's, it's, it's rare to find a picture. They don't want interpreters in the picture. So. You don't know him? Does anybody know this man? Is he a real interpreter? Do we allow this? One hopes. One just hopes. Uh, this is the end of my story now. Um, uh, I've decided to change careers altogether, and I had, uh, I think, pretty recognize this man, no, probably not. Danny Boone. He's a French actor. He's uh, the most highly paid French actor. More than Depardieu. Oh. And a film crew ended up filming a scene of his latest film in my flat. And you have all to go and see it. It's called Super Condriac, and there's a seduction scene that happens. It would be in my flat, the seduction scene. But anyway, seduction scene, and it was all done in my flat, and it was one of the most fun days I've ever had with that French film crew in my flat. <laughs> you need languages everywhere, don't you? You even need to do interpretation here. Thank you very much for this. <laughs>